Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture, which is going to continue our discussion about the Italian Renaissance, although today we are going to learn all about the art of the Italian Renaissance. So your objective today actually inc incorporates both lectures of 1.2, the first part and the second part. You will need to explain the political, intellectual, and cultural effects of the Italian Renaissance. And here's a hint. Art is considered to be a cultural topic. So hopefully that will help you answer your objective at the end of the lecture. So the art of the Italian Renaissance is probably one of the most important aspects to understanding the Renaissance as a cultural movement. The art of the Renaissance is going to look very, very different than the art of the Middle Ages, right? And one of the ways it starts to look different is this idea of naturalism. So they want art to look natural. They want it to look realistic, more like the real world. And so this introduces an emphasis on realism, perspective, and also a focus on correct an anatomy, an accurate anatomy, and the portrayal of humans in particular. So Renaissance artists considered the imitation of nature their primary goal. <clears throat> and so this introduces what is basically a human-centered naturalism into Western art, a human-centered naturalism. And to achieve this human-centered naturalism, Renaissance artists would actually develop mathematical techniques and utilize scientific observation to accurately portray reality in art. An example of these mathematical techniques is something called linear perspective. Linear perspective is an example of that mathematical technique. It's sort of a, a geo, uh, uh, something that comes from geometry because they want to create um, that sense of depth with the vanishing point at the back of the, uh, the art. So they want to give the art kind of that depth and that 3D look. That's what linear perspective is used for. Also, many artists would take a very scientific approach to observing and analyzing the human body because they wanted to portray the human body realistically. They wanted to be able to convey emotion and contortion pain and stress within the human body. This focus on the human body and the study of human anatomy did result in the growth of the popularity of nudity in art. Now, nudity was very common in classical art, in uh, especially kind of um, the art of, of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, these pagan societies as the church would consider them. But nudity was also seen as a more natural and expressive form of human, um, of human portrayal, right? Uh, um, nudity became very pop was very popular in those statues of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and so we start to see a return of nudity in art in the Renaissance. Now, one of the reasons we did not see nudity in art during the Middle Ages is because it was considered obscene and controversial by the church. And even as we get into the Renaissance, the church will still largely consider nudity in art to be obscene and controversial. But overall, the art of the Renaissance is a dramatic departure from the flat simplicity of medieval and Byzantine art. Renaissance art also demonstrates those new themes of humanism, individualism, and secularism. I would even argue that these new intellectual themes of the Renaissance are most identifiable in the art of the Renaissance. So you can actually identify, look, there's humanism. Look, there is an example of individualism. Look, there is an example of secularism. Um, and this, uh, the incorporation of these themes reflects a new attitude of mind. Again, where the humans are the focus of the attention in art. So again, that human-centered naturalism. This is different, of course, than the Middle Ages, where art was entirely religious. And yes, we will still see many religious themes in art, but even within those religious thematic paintings, humans will look more realistic. They will still be the center of attention, even if it's a religious theme. Now, the individualism theme of art 
actually leads to a rise in portraiture. So individualism leads to a rise in portraiture. A portrait is a painting, like a formal painting of a single person. Think of it sort of like as a your school photo, right? So that's like a, a portrait. And um, wealthy people, these patrons, loved to pay to have portraits created of themselves and their family members. But also patrons frequently appeared as characters in sacred or famous paintings. Like for example, think of the painting The Last Supper. Um, it's possible that in a painting like that, I'm not saying that one in particular, that whoever commissioned or paid for that painting would request that the artist depict the patron and maybe members of their families as the examples for various characters in the painting. So characters in the painting would have the physical likeness of the patron and his family. And that was a way of sort of showing off to everyone, you know, this patron was the one who commissioned this painting and they were trying to be, trying to impress people in that, in that city at the time. Also patrons um, would commission artists to create these monumental tombs, right? And also uh, portrait statues to honor patrons. So for example, the Medici family commissioned artists to build basically an entire church that the Medici family would be um, entombed in. This is called the Church of San Lorenzo in the middle of Florence. And uh, famous artists like Michelangelo would contribute to the uh, creation of that church, the Church of San Lorenzo. But also in individualism and portraiture, this is a, an example of how artists had that new focus on accurate human portrayal, specifically accurate facial features and a depiction of personalities. Here on the left, you can see an example of one of the most famous portraits of the Renaissance, which is also one of the most fam famous paintings in Western art. This is the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And this painting is a portrait of a wealthy Italian merchant's wife. Um, and Leonardo da Vinci took great care to depict accurate facial features, um, even a hint of emotion. And that's one of the things that's most intriguing about this painting is, you know, what exactly is the emotion of Miss Mona Lisa? Because it looks like she has sort of a sly smile here, um, but she's also very relaxed, right? What is she thinking about? It's somewhat intriguing. And you can also see how the background like recedes behind her, creating that sense of depth. That's an example of using linear perspective to try to create that 3D effect in art. But there's many examples of this type of portraiture uh, throughout the Renaissance and really throughout the art of Europe in the modern era. Another example of how individualism infiltrates art is the idea that the artist himself is now considered a genius, right? So the artist himself is going to be considered a genius and there's going to be a glorification of their individual ability, right? So again, celebrating that idea of human achievement and accomplishment, but with a focus on that individual. Artists were now seen as heroes and geniuses, as eccentrics to be embraced and, and, and celebrated by society. And this kind of helps us start to recognize the more modern concept of, say, celebrity and fame, particularly in the art world. Like, think about, you know, how famous and how much influence various celebrities may have today, actors and singers and musicians and people like that. We tend to glorify that artistic talent. And so this also represents growing social and cultural respect for artists in the Renaissance, which is also a big change from the Middle Ages, where art was not seen as a respectable profession that gained people lots of money and fame. And the most talented artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo would be welcomed into the political and intellectual elite of Renaissance Italy. So those wealthy, powerful families like the Medici or the Borgias, um, would almost compete to patronize those most famous artists. And like I said, this is all very different from the Middle Ages when artists were just viewed as another type of craftsman who did not receive that same level of respect and fame. <clears throat> also, many artists demonstrated this new concept of being a Renaissance man. 
We mentioned this uh, concept back when we were talking about uh, Castiglione's De Courtier. But again, the idea of a Renaissance man is a person who knows a great deal about many things, someone who's multi-talented, and the person who is often cited as being the ultimate an original Renaissance man is Leonardo da Vinci, because not only is he one of the most famous artists in history, but he also was an inventor and he studied everything, as we will learn about later on. And then finally, I want to address the idea of secularism in art. Remember, secularism is the idea of subject matter that is not religious. So what we will start to see in Renaissance art is uh, the topics of paintings that are not religious. Okay, yes, there are still gonna be many religious themed paintings, but for example, portraits are not always going to be religious. And also there will be um, some artists who like to incorporate scenes from Greco-Roman mythology. So that is also an example of secularism in art. And it's an example of how the Renaissance embraced and celebrated that classical culture of Greece and Rome. So we'll see many examples of secularism in art throughout this lecture. And last but not least, I want to emphasize this point that art became a status symbol and that wealthy families like the Medici and others patronized the arts to demonstrate their political and social power, right? So art equals social status. It became a way to demonstrate political and social power. Um, these families used art to reflect the image they wanted to portray of themselves to the rest of their society or their city-state. And the patronage of these wealthy families was important for developing artists. Um, in the process of patronage, the artists would be given money and, and to, to create or build or sculpt whatever the project was that the, the family, the patron, wanted. And so this patronage gave artists time and money to develop their skills, but again, they were often beholden to the desires of the patron, which potentially could limit true creativity and genius. And even the most famous artists of the Renaissance, like da Vinci and Raphael and Michelangelo, all started their careers with patrons, although those artists would become so famous and, and, and desired as, as, as artists that they were less beholden to the wishes of their patrons as they became more famous. But classical text of the, of the Greco-Roman era suggested that an active life included playing a, an important role in one's community, right? Th think of that idea of civic humanism. So many of these wealthy Renaissance families who supported the idea of humanism believed that they should make good use of their wealth. And they did this by commissioning public art, right? Public works of art that became buildings or statues that celebrated the glory of, say, their city-state. We will see this many times in Florence. And by commissioning art, especially for the benefit of the public, it seemed to confirm this moral leadership for that family or that patron or a right to govern for them. Again, think of the Medici as the classic example. And the last point I want to make is that art manifested corporate power. So it wasn't just these families or individuals that would commission art, but we also see groups like merchant guilds, city-states, even the Catholic Church would get in on the art patronage game. And this became part of that entrepreneurial, progressive, even capitalistic spirit of the Renaissance that would influence many other elements of the modern era. So now we're going to take a little journey through Renaissance art, starting with the earliest manifest manifestations in art in the 14th century, so when we're still kind of technically in the late Middle Ages, um, and then we will see how art progresses, it becomes increasingly complex and, act, and, and, and realistic with that human-centered naturalism until we get to the great geniuses of Michelangelo and da Vinci and Raphael during the High Renaissance. Now you may remember from the previous lecture that the Renaissance begins in Florence. 
Yes, it begins in Italy collectively, but specifically Florence is where we see the first manifestations of the early Renaissance. And in the world of art, the first artists who began to demonstrate Renaissance themes were the artists of Giotto and Masaccio. And again, Florence became the sort of birthplace of Renaissance art and other Renaissance elements because of its political stability, its economic vitality, um, the fact that it had this cultural value of learning. This is what made Florence the natural birthplace of the artistic Renaissance. And these artists, Giotto and Masaccio, uh, both focused on realism and the imitation of nature as their goal. Their skills are going to be a bit more limited because they are the first artists to experiment with this. Um, but they also would attempt to portray these monumental figures that showed human emotion, even in the depiction of religious scenes. They tried to create a realistic relationship between figures and landscape by utilizing early attempts at the uh, of linear perspective, so trying to create that sense of depth. So again, even though this will not be the most impressive art of the Renaissance, it is art that starts to attempt to demonstrate that new Renaissance style. So let's first look at some examples by Chateau. The painting you see here on the right is uh, from the Scrovengi Chapel. Um, in Padua, Italy. This is one of a series of frescoes. So I'm going to tell you briefly what a fresco is. A fresco is not a typical painting where paint is applied to a canvas. A fresco is a painting onto the wall of a building, right? But the paint is applied when the plaster of the wall is still wet. So imagine like you're building a wall and you're putting the plaster on the wall to create that smooth surface. While the plaster is still wet, the painting um, is painted onto that wet plaster. And so then the paint dries into the plaster as opposed to on top of it. And this creates a more permanent image. That's why we have these frescoes from, you know, six, seven hundred years ago that are still intact today, although they do show some wear and tear. All right, you can, still, you can probably already see that Jateau's uh, fresco here still has a lot of medieval characteristics. And so that's why we consider Jateau to be more proto-Renaissance. All right, so he is starting to demonstrate some of those Renaissance themes, but he's also still is strongly influenced by medieval art. But he is the first artist to really demonstrate a definite break from very traditional medieval art. Chateau um, attempted in this scene, which as you can see is a, a religious scene. Uh, this is, I think, shortly after Christ's uh, crucifixion, right? Because you can see Christ on the bottom there. Um, so Chateau was attempting as best he could with his skill level to create these three-dimensional figures with more realistic faces, realistic gestures, a sense of emotion, right? I mean, even though it's more simplistic, you look at the figures in this painting and you get a sense of their emotion. Also, he was attempting to portray the more natural form of these people. You look at the drape of their clothing, um, which is a more realistic. There's also a forced perspective here, right, where he's attempting to create some sense of depth, but Again, it looks more like the setting backdrop on a stage play than a real, true linear perspective. So Jateau was one of the first notable artists of the, of the early Renaissance in Florence. Uh, so he painted these series of frescoes in the Scrovengi Chapel. But also he was an architect, and he was one of the early architects for the Florence Cathedral that we will see images of later. And he actually was responsible for designing the bell tower in the Florence Cathedral, which takes almost 200 years to build and finally complete. The next artist we're going to learn about is Masaccio. And I'm going to move on to this image here because this is Masaccio's painting, uh, fresco, I should say, called Tribute Money. Again, this is another 
religious scene, you know, of Christ and his disciples from the Bible. Um, this is located in the Brancacci Chapel in, uh, that's part of the Santa Maria del Carmine Church in Florence, Italy, and it was painted later in the 1420s. So this followed um, Jateau but almost a century later, right? Jateau was painting in the early 14th century, and so Masaccio painted in the early 15th century. And so you can see that Masaccio's skill has developed considerably since uh, Jateau's paintings in the previous century. And uh, Masaccio's contributions are very important in the development of early Renaissance art. So Jateau is noted for his revolutionary use of perspective, because again, you can see that use of perspective and how the background fades into the difference is more advanced and realistic than Jateau's work. And also he started to utilize a new artistic technique called uh, chiaroscuro. And I'm going to spell that for you because it's not only hard to say, it's hard to spell. It's an Italian word. It is spelled C-H-I-A-R-O-S-C-U-R-O, chiaroscuro, C-H-I-A-R-O, S-C-U-R-O. And uh, this, this technique, this is an artistic technique, chiascuro, uh, is when the artist uses contrasting light and shading to create a sense of three-dimensional objects and figures, which again may not seem like a big deal to us today because we're so used to seeing that type of depth in art. But at the time, it's a really revolutionary artistic technique. But if we look at this painting, we can also see those attempts at human-centered naturalism. Obviously, the humans are the overall focus of the painting. Um, they have realistic facial features and bodies. They have realistic clothing and how it drapes around their bodies. There's a sense of conversation and action going on, right? So it does feel a lot more realistic overall. Okay, moving on to an artist that you may have more familiarity with. This is Sandro Botticelli, who is, um, we're going to see a uh, paint a little bit later in the 15th century, but still part of that famous Quattrocento period in Florence. So Sandro Botticelli was born in Florence, and he, importantly, was patronized by the Medici family. He is one of the more famous uh, Florence, Florentine Renaissance artists, and perhaps his most famous painting is what you see here. This is called The Birth of Venus, and it was painted in 1485, and currently you can see this in the Uffizi Gallery, which is a famous museum in Florence, Italy. Here is a great example of secularism in art, because this is a scene from Roman mythology. It is not a form uh, it is not a scene from the Bible, like the previous art that we've seen. So this is, you know, the birth of the goddess Venus, where she comes out of the sea on, riding on a clamshell, right? So this demonstrates that focus and celebration of classical culture, and of course, it's an example of secularism. This is an, also an example of one of the first um, human nudes in Renaissance art. So that also demonstrates the theme of humanism because here we have a human, a nude human, as the center focus point of the painting. And again, portrayed in a very realistic, although we might also say idealistic manner because of course this woman is painted to look very beautiful and attractive and ideal. And notice how she's standing kind of off center, right? Like her weight is shifted onto one hip or one foot. This is another new artistic technique that we will see called contraposto. Again, I will spell that for you. Contraposto. C-O-N-T-A-R-P-P-O-S-T-O. -P -P contraposto. And that basically is the idea of, of humans standing more naturally right? Humans don't stand straight forward, arms at the side, looking like a paper doll. Humans tend to have their weight on one leg or the other, or their hand on their hip, right? If you observe how regular people stand most of the time. So that's another example of trying to incorporate those realistic 
um, ideas into Renaissance art. Now this particular painting was commissioned by the Medici family to decorate a new villa and one of the ways we know it was commissioned by the Medicis is the trees in the background. These are actually orange trees and oranges were a symbol of the Medici family. There was located, it was actually, the oranges were used on the family's coat of arms, right? So that's how we know if we were living in Florence at the time who commissioned this painting. Let's move on now to one of the most famous um, uh, sculptors of the early Renaissance. This is Donato di Donatello. Um, so Donatello is one of the first notable sculptors of the Renaissance. Uh, he created the first life-size life freestanding bronze nude in European art since antiquity, which is the famous statue David that you see here. Now, before he created the statue of David, he studied extensively and copied the statues of antiquity that he could observe, especially in the city of Rome. Now, David is, of course, a biblical figure. This comes from the biblical story of David and Goliath. And um, this is, we're going to see several different um, interpretations of this character of David, especially during that conflict with the giant Goliath. We'll see one from Donatello. We'll see one by Michelangelo, which is probably the most famous. And then we'll see one in the Baroque period by the artist Bernini. So again, the, one of the reasons this is significant is because it is the first bronze statue since antiquity. Um, it also is one of the first nude statues created since antiquity. And it demonstrates that human-centered naturalism. You can see how David is standing in the contraposto stance with his um, weight shifted onto one foot, right? And this particular moment is after David has defeated the giant Goliath. And he, you can see, because you can see the giant Goliath's head beneath David's foot. And so David is proud. He's kind of showing off. You can get, get that sense from his body language. Now, this particular statue was uh, commissioned to celebrate Florentine heroism, right? This was likely commissioned by uh, a member of the Medici family, their patriarch, Cosimo de' Medici, who was the, the patriarch who kind of put the Medici family on the map and made them powerful in Florence. And this likely celebrates um, Florence's defeat uh, of another city-state in battle, maybe Pisa or something like that. But overall, this statue reflects simplicity, strength, and the dignity of humanity. Again, making it a classic example of Renaissance art. And if you ever wanted to see this uh, statue, it is located in the Bargello Museum of Florence, Italy. And now we're going to look at an example of early Renaissance architecture. Because art includes not just paintings, but it also includes statues and architecture as well. So the most famous architect of the early Renaissance is a man named Filippo Brunelleschi. Filippo Brunelleschi. And he is going to help complete the Florence Cathedral that you see here. Um, the, the formal name of the Florence Cathedral is the Santa Maria del Fiore, so St. Mary of the Flower. But more frequently, it is referred to just as the Florence Cathedral or even the Duomo. Uh, which refers to the giant dome you see there at the right end of the cathedral. And that dome is what Brunelleschi is responsible for. Now, the Florence Cathedral initially began in the 13th century, and many artists and architects contributed to the building of this cathedral. And this is a great example of monumental architecture. So the city-state of Florence wanted to build this big, beautiful, impressive cathedral to show off their wealth, their power, their, their, their cultural sophistication and influence. But they would get to the point where they were sort of too ambitious and they had completed the entire cathedral except for the very end because it turns out no one knew at the time how to build a dome, right? A dome is a classic example of, um, class, is of, of classical architecture from say ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, those, those civilizations were able to build domes, but that engineering and architectural knowledge had been lost during the 
during the Middle Ages. So for several years, even decades, the right end of that cathedral where the dome is was actually empty. It didn't have a roof because no one knew how to complete it until Brunelleschi. So Brunelleschi was uh, inspired by Roman architecture and he went to Rome to study examples of that ancient Roman architecture. Things like the arches and domes and columns. Those are all classic examples of, of Greco-Roman architecture. And his incorporation of the dome, specifically in this church, represents the revival of classical architecture, which is another important characteristic of the Renaissance, the return of those arches, domes, and columns in Western architecture. Now, Brunelleschi was actually not a formally trained architect at the time, but he had spent many years working in Rome and studying the excavations of Roman ruins while he was there. And he returned to Florence after his studies and he won a contest to build the, the dome or the roof on this great Florence cathedral. And if you ask me in class what that contest consisted of, I might be able to tell you that story. Overall, he would spend 16 years building this dome using new techniques like new engineering techniques and new types of machinery that he had to invent himself just to figure out how to build the dome. So he wasn't just a designer, he wasn't just an architect, he was also an engineer because he had to figure out how the heck to actually build this dome. And this demonstrates that his skill and his intellect was really far, far ahead of his time. And the creation of the, the Duomo and the completion of the Florence Cathedral paved the way for the cultural and social revolutions of the Renaissance. Um, through Brunelleschi's complex synthesis of inspiration and analysis, uh, his bold reworking of the classical past to the needs and the aspirations of the present really represents that Renaissance spirit, right? So he's innovative, he's inventive, he's creative, he's talented, and he is really synthesizing, meaning he's putting together, you know, inspiration from the classical period with the style of the architecture, but he is also making it work for the modern world that he's living in, in Florence. And so again, this is really one of the most famous buildings in Florence, if not all of Italy. It is, is clearly the centerpiece of the city, and the completion of Duomo was a great moment of celebration for the people of Florence. And other Renaissance artists would also contribute frescoes and other art to the cathedral. So again, this cathedral was not entirely designed and built by a single person, and we will see that's pretty common for these big fancy cathedrals of the time, uh, but many artists over decades, if not centuries, will contribute to the construction and the design of these magnificent buildings. So that brings us now to a period known as the High Renaissance, which will take place more in the city of Rome. So Florence is the birthplace and the home of the early Renaissance, particularly in the Quattrocento, the 1400s. But by the time we get to like the late 1400s and early 1500s, that early 16th century, we will see the cultural center and heart of the Renaissance shift from Florence to Rome. And this period is now known as the High Renaissance. And one of the reasons the, the sort of cultural center of the Renaissance shifts down to Rome is because the Catholic Church is going to get involved in commissioning Renaissance art. So this is why Rome becomes this new center of the Renaissance in the early 16th century. Also, some other sort of outlying contributing factors is that some of the other Italian city-states, especially in the north, we're losing political and economic power because of conflicts with France and Spain. There had been some invasions by France into northern Italy, which had significantly weakened the political strength and influence of states like Florence. And again, the Catholic Church, which continued to be very powerful and could also sort of still withstand the, um, you know, the potential incursions of France and Spain, 
um, decided that they wanted a piece of the action, right? You know, they, even though the church was, of course, you know, very religious and still had some medieval values, they will embrace the artistic spirit of the Renaissance because, again, art shows power. And the Catholic Church wanted to show everyone how powerful they were. The best way to do that is by commissioning and creating the best art possible. And specifically, the Renaissance papacy would inspire some of the monumentalism that defines the High Renaissance as it seeks to assert its authority and its image and also recover public confidence and um, restore its, you know, its, its sort of idea of, of being famous and popular, especially after some of those scandals of the Avignon papacy. And also the Renaissance um, was brought down to Rome because the Catholic Church had actually begun the uh, formal excavation of the Roman Forum. So the Forum was like the town center of of ancient Rome during the days of the empire, and it had been buried under many, many feet of dirt over the past several centuries. And so starting in about the 1470s, the Catholic Church um, sponsored the formal excavation of the Roman Forum that many artists like Brunelleschi and Raphael would participate in, and that led to discoveries of classical art and sculpture and, and architecture that inspired the contemporary artists of the Renaissance. All right, now let's focus on who defines the High Renaissance. The High Renaissance is known for the most famous artists of the Renaissance. We would argue some of the most famous Renaissance in all of Western civilization. This includes Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael and Michelangelo, so three of your four Ninja Turtles, as you may know. So let's start with Leonardo da Vinci. As I've mentioned before, Leonardo da Vinci was a true Renaissance man, a true genius in every sense of the word. He studied everything to see more clearly how nature worked. So to give you an idea of the type of things he studied or, or worked on, he looked into invention, painting, sculpting, architecture, science, music, mathematics, engineering, literature, anatomy, geology, astronomy, botany, writing, history, and cartography, just to name a few. Don't worry, you don't have to write all of those down. Just emphasize that, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Renaissance man, studied everything, total genius. But he is also most famous for the art that he created, so let's take a look at some of that art. So on the left side of the page, you can see one of his most famous paintings. This is called The Last Supper. This is obviously a biblical scene with Christ and his disciples having their last supper before the crucifixion the next day. This is a fresco that is located in the Santa Maria della Grazie Chapel in Milan, Italy. And this fresco is a great summary of 15th century trends, so of the Quattrocento. Um, you can see that this really demonstrates that idea of linear perspective very well. Look at how the room recedes naturally into the background. It's almost kind of geometric in how it recedes. And so kind of right behind the head of Christ, that would be the vanishing point, like if you kept going, going, going back into the painting. It also utilizes a great organization of space, right? It is balanced. Um, even though it was, it's a religious painting, the humans are still front and center. They are the focus of the painting. The use of perspective is evident in the artist's um, ability to depict the subjects three-dimensionally, right? And then also, like I said, there's that humanist element. There's a psychological dimension to the characters of this painting. You can see their gestures, their movements, their interactions, their facial expression, their emotion, right? So all of that is an example of that human-centered naturalism, even though it is a religious scene. Da Vinci's other famous painting here is the Mona Lisa. This is not a fresco. This is a more traditional painting of oil on canvas. Um, this is currently located in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, and it is a uh, very, very popular painting there. You usually have to stand in line for a while to see it. And it's also very small. Um, it, it's really only, 
you know, say a foot tall and a, and a little bit less in terms of its width. It's a pretty small painting. Um, this was a painting that was commissioned by a, a wealthy Italian merchant. Uh, he wanted da Vinci to paint, you know, this portrait of, of the merchant's beautiful wife. And this painting really reflects the humanist interest in <laughs> individual facial expressions and also in painting realistic landscapes as backgrounds. Now, one of the reasons this is such a famous and significant portrait is because it's one of the first portraits that is that depicts the subject facing forward as opposed to in a profile. So in the early Renaissance, most portraits were a pure profile image, whereas this portrait has the Mona Lisa facing forward, but not straight forward, right? She's kind of still at a natural angle. And also you will notice that there is this um, sort of complex use of shading around her face and her neck and her hairline. This is a new artistic technique called sfumato. And I will spell that for you as well. It is S-F-U-M-A-T-O, sfumato. It means smoky, basically. And this is <clears throat> how Leonardo da Vinci uses, utilized this soft blending to create smooth transitions, kind of like, think of like a smoke, all right? So that smoky effect. Um, and that helps to create a realistic um, depiction of the subject's face and also gives it a soft, natural um, advanced and, and complex look, right? And we will see many other artists utilize that same sfumato technique, like Raphael. So Raphael is another giant of the Renaissance. Um, he becomes very, very famous early on. He is one of, considered to be one of Italy's best and most talented painters by the time he is 25 years old. And he is also credited with introducing this new standard of human beauty. Um, so we're going to look at two examples of his art. On the left side, here is a, a portrait, but it's also a religious scene. This is St. Catherine of Alexandria. This is an oil painting on a panel that is located in the National Gallery, currently in London, in the United Kingdom. And you can see that there's a lot of inspiration from Leonardo da Vinci, that idea of the uh, sfumato technique, right, to create this sort of smooth but also smoky, elegant effect. Um, there's the contraposto stance, right, where she's not facing straight forward. She has her weight shifted in a more natural way. Um, there's a sense of emotion. There is the linear perspective with the natural background. So again, all of this is a very uh, clear example of the themes of Renaissance art. So again, even though it's religious, this, the human and their depiction is still the center of the painting. But Raphael's most famous work of art, and I would argue one of the most important uh, pieces of the entire Renaissance, is what we see on the right here. This is the School of Athens. So this was a fresco um, that is actually located in Vatican City. This fresco was commissioned by Pope Julius II, who we will learn is a very powerful and influential pope during the Renaissance, Pope Julius II. And he hired uh, Raphael to paint this fresco in the private Vatican library. Fortunately, you can still see this fresco if you go on a tour of the Vatican museums in, um, in Italy today. Now, this painting is considered to be Raphael's masterpiece. It embodies the spirit and the themes of the Renaissance more than any other painting, I would argue. So first of all, we can see that, that use of perspective, that, that linear perspective with the uh, background receding farther and farther away to create that natural sense of depth. We also see the celebration of antiquity right? Look at the architecture, the arches, the domes, right? This looks very much like the classical architecture of, of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And also the people in the painting, obviously they're at the front and center, but these people actually depict classical figures, all right? So famous um, intellectuals and artists from antiquity, 
like Plato and Socrates um, and other, you know, famous um, men from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. But this is what's really cool about the painting. The likeness of those figures doubles with the likeness of current Renaissance artists and intellectuals. So for example, in the very center, right, this guy in the robes, so that's supposed to be Plato, but also this looks a lot like Leonardo da Vinci, right? That's kind of cool. And if you go through, um, there's painting, there's many other people here, like this is um, supposed to be, I think, Heraclitus of antiquity, but it also looks more like Michelangelo of the contemporary Renaissance era. And that I think is just so, so cool. And it also, again, represents really what the Renaissance is all about, the fusion, the syncretism of the classical past with the genius and the talent of this modern era of these, of these men who, work, who are working and creating and living in the Renaissance. Um, what's also kind of funny is a little uh, about this, this painting is it's very, you know, it's, it's very famous. It becomes very popular, but uh, notice how the guy who portrays Michelangelo down here is kind of brooding and unhappy and sort of antisocial, which is very characteristic of Michelangelo as a real person. Um, so Michelangelo actually hated Raphael because Raphael was like, the golden boy of the Catholic Church, Raphael, was handsome and popular and went to all the parties and, you know, was wealthy and lived, a, you know, a, a, a fantastic life, which is one of the reasons he kind of died young. And Michelangelo was not any of those things, although he was still brilliant and talented. And so anyways, Michelangelo accused Raphael of plagiarism um, and said that, you know, Raphael was ripping off his style. But I think you know, everyone is able to create these beautiful masterpieces without specific claims of plagiarism. Now, speaking of Michelangelo, let's move on to learn about some of his work. Michelangelo is, in my opinion, the best Renaissance artist. That's in my opinion. I would not say everyone agrees with me, but I just find his work to be breathtaking. So Michelangelo is also a Renaissance man. He was a painter, although he primarily considered himself to be a sculptor. That's what he went to school for and did his training in. He was also an architect, as we will see, and he will leave his mark in all of those areas as a painter, as a sculptor, and as an architect. Uh, he was very famous during his own lifetime. Um, he is even now, like Raphael and da Vinci, considered one of the greatest Western artists ever. In fact, his nickname during the Renaissance was Il Divino, which means the divine, because he was so talented, it meant that he must have some divine power infused by God. Um, Michelangelo was also known as a passionate and determined worker. Uh, he was not, you know, a super social partier like Raphael. He was very committed to his work, um, and so he could be a little difficult to, to get along with in, in that way. But still, this allowed him to present uh, this work that creates this sense of, of awe-inspiring grandeur. I mean, his work is just breathtaking, jaw-dropping. It is awesome in all the most literal senses of those terms. Um, Michelangelo was also devoutly Catholic. He was known for its, in, his intense personality. Like I said, he became very, very determined in his work. Um, which, like I said, could make it difficult for him to work with, especially for those patrons. Um, he was very abstemious, meaning he didn't go out and, and party and everything like uh, Raphael. And also, there is um, a lot of belief that Michelangelo might have been a homosexual because he never married. And there are letters written between Michelangelo and his very good male friend. Um, now, some students have asked in the past, like, well, if wasn't the church anti-homosexuality, like, why would they hire and promote Michelangelo if they knew he was gay? Well, it wasn't necessarily, first of all, a, 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 a matter of public opinion or something that people really knew about him. And even if they suspected, they really turned a, bli a blind eye to it and, and still embraced him because of his genius and his talent. 
All right, um, so Michelangelo not only creates some of the most important and definitive work of the High Renaissance, we will also see that later in his life, because he lives to be 80, he will actually lay the foundations for the next art movement that we learn about, which is mannerism. But we'll see examples of that later in another lecture. But for now, let's look at some of his early uh, work in sculpture, which is, again, just absolutely amazing. On the right, you can see one of his first famous sculptors, sculptures. This is called the Pieta. This depicts the um, Virgin Mary, you know, the, the mother of Christ, um, cradling her dead son after he has been crucified. This is carved out of marble. And it is currently located in St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, Italy. Now, this piece was originally commissioned by a French cardinal for his own funeral monument, but the church then later decided that this statue was too beautiful and magnificent to be wasted on a French cardinal. So it was moved to a more prominent position um, in, the, in the basilica so that when you walk in, you can see it immediately to your right in this little chapel area. But what I want to point out here is look at the, first of all, look at the, the emotion on Mary's face, that sense of sadness, but it's also a resigned, calm, serene sadness. Look at the folds on her dress. I would like to remind you, this is carved out of marble. Look at the folds down here by her knees and how that is depicted. Look at the realistic um, uh, body of Christ, again, and how it is uh, carved out of marble. You can see the bones in his ankles, his ribs. You can see the veins in his fingers. Um, it is just, again, so, so incredible that this was created by Michelangelo when he was like in his 20s, right? So that's a very famous piece but really, I would say his most famous um, sculpture that is also a defining characteristic of the Renaissance is his sculpture of David that we see on the left here. Um, this was carved out of a single block of marble, once again. Um, it is located in the Academia Museum in Florence, Italy, although there is a replica of it that is located in um, a public square in Florence in an area known as the Piazza della Signoria, uh, and uh, that, that's a replica. The original one is in the museum because they don't want it to be damaged. Now, this David is probably the ultimate example of human-centered naturalism because it exalts the beauty of the human body, right? This is you know, not just realistic. It is an idealistic portrayal of um, the male nude, right? This is the type of thing where, you know, men want to be him, women want him type of thing. Um, because his, he's very muscular, his body is very detailed, right? It is also a, a nude sculpture, which represents that focus on human nudity and the celebration and embracement of the human form. Now, this particular statue was commissioned by the government of the city of Florence, and Michelangelo was originally from Florence. And this is considered to be one of the ultimate examples of humanist art, not only because of the skill and the beauty of it, but also um, because it combines what is ultimately a religious theme with classical figures, right? So it is the religious story of David and Goliath, but it is depicted in the more classical style of the statues of antiquity. And it represents, again, that human-centered naturalism and that paradigm of human beauty. Now, this is also a different David than we see from Donatello's sculpture. Donatello's was, of course, bronze, and this is marble. And Donatello's sculpture, if you think back to it, depicts a more useful, triumphant, almost kind of like cocky David, right, who has just defeated the giant Goliath. Whereas this David, um, this is a, 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 a grown man right? He's not youthful. Um, and this is before he casts the stone at Goliath. And you can see him holding the stone there in his left hand. And his brow is furrowed and he's concentrating, and he's contemplating the task ahead of him and the challenges that he faces. So again, there's a much different 
emotion, feeling, just kind of whole ethos coming from this statue of David compared to, say, Donatello's. And again, that's another example of the power and nuance of this Renaissance art. All right, let's move on now to some of Michelangelo's paintings and arguably some of his most famous work, some of the most notable work in Western civilization as well. All right, <clears throat> so Michelangelo would be commissioned by the Catholic Church to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He was commissioned specifically by Pope Julius II, who also commissioned Raphael's School of Athens. And the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is arguably one of the most important works of art in all of Western civilization. This is a fresco painted directly onto the ceiling. Now, let me tell you a little about the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel, we know, first of all, this is where the cardinals select the new pope whenever that process is needed. This was also originally, during the Renaissance, kind of the pope's private chapel. So it was one of the most important places in in the Catholic Church. Um, today it's you know a popular tourist attraction although it is closed still for religious use when necessary but if you go to visit Vatican City you can walk through the Sistine Chapel and look at the buildings although I will warn you it is very very crowded and usually packed with with tourists and you're not allowed to talk and you're not allowed to take cell phone pictures while you're in there either otherwise the Italian guards will yell at you and yes we know from experience that that will happen. All right so this, this uh, painting depicts nine scenes from the book of Genesis um, the, on the ceiling here. And what you're seeing right here is the ceiling from the perspective of the Pope because he enters the chapel from this side that we kind of view it from. And he looks up and this is what um, he sees. Okay, so again, this is a biblical scene, of course. But the most famous image in all of it is this one right here, the creation of Adam from the book of Genesis. And I want you to take a closer look at this because hopefully you can already identify some themes of the Renaissance, right? Even though it's religious, there's still that human-centered naturalism um, with the you know realistic, if not ideal, depiction of the human body. Adam is nude, right? And he is reaching out to this, um, this figure on the right, which we're going to assume is God. And God is granting life and intelligence and all the things that make humans human, all right? So he is granting that, granting that through his touch with Adam. But look at this shape of this, of, of that, that God is sitting in, okay? Um, what does it look like? Look at that shape. What does it remind you of? Does it remind you of, say, a certain piece of human anatomy, right? And if you're thinking it looks like a human brain, then you are correct. And so think about what that means. Think about what that message might be that Michelangelo is trying to send in this painting. So if God here is kind of equivalent to the human brain, right? He's reaching out and giving life to Adam. Michelangelo is, argue, you know, is sort of making this, this subtle argument that, um, humanity and its life is is really defined by its intelligence and its capability so even though this is a very religious topic there is that subtle message of humanism um, embedded in it which i think also depicts that genius of michelangelo um anyways this again is just an amazing work of art uh michelangelo uses a lot of the techniques of the Renaissance, chiascuro, contraposto, sfumato, to create these incredible images on the ceiling. I can tell you that if you're standing on the floor and looking up at a figure like this guy right here, the images are so well done, it looks like they are completely three-dimensional, or this figure right here, that their legs are hanging off the side of the, of the ceiling like a real three-dimensional figure. Now, there's some interesting stories behind the creation of the, uh, of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Like I mentioned, Michelangelo was commissioned by Pope Julius II, who was this really powerful uh, and influential pope. Like he's, 
considered to be, you know, just one, one of the most impressive uh, popes in, in the whole history of the church. Um, you know, he thought himself very much as the king of kings in Europe at the time. But I also mentioned, you, you might remember that Michelangelo is a very passionate, determined worker and um, doesn't like to compromise his style. But Julius II was also very powerful. And so there was a lot of conflict actually between Michelangelo and Julius II. They got in arguments about what the ceiling should look like and everything like that. Uh, Michelangelo is like, screw you, Pope. I'm going to do what I want to do. And Julius is like, you can't tell me that. I'm the Pope. And anyways, it all worked out. You know, it came to a happy ending. Um, and when the ceiling was finally done, you know, Michelangelo invited the Pope, you know, Julius II in to view the ceiling. And the story goes that Julius II was so overwhelmed by Michelangelo's creation and its beauty and its magnificence that he fell to his knees and he wept with joy because he was so impressed. And I'm sure Michelangelo was thinking in his head, ha ha ha, I told you so. But anyways, enough about that. You will notice also on the back wall of the Sistine Chapel, there's another painting with a blue background that is called The Last Judgment. Oh, I don't have a specific image of it here, but we will learn more about the uh, Last Judgment later um, when we get to mannerism, because this is also create a fresco created by Michelangelo, although many decades later, when Michelangelo is much, much older. Um, and while this also is a religious scene that, that consists of many similar elements that we would see during the Renaissance, we will see that um, it also has a different, unique style, which is the beginning of the next art genre known as mannerism. But I'm going to save our discussion on The Last Judgment for another day. And we're going to finish with Michelangelo's contribution to architecture, and that is St. Peter's Basilica. So let me give you a little bit of history and context about this building in general before we get into Michelangelo's contribution. Um, so St. Peter's Basilica, this is like the mothership of the Catholic Church. Uh, this is honestly one of the most beautiful and impressive churches in the entire world. And, you know, you would hope it to be if it's the seat of the Catholic Church. Um, it is also uh, built on what is supposedly the grave of St. Peter, who, as we know, is the original Pope, the original Bishop of Rome. Now, this is the second St. Peter's Basilica to exist. At the beginning of the Renaissance, the, papy, the papacy decided to rebuild this building. So it was bigger, it was more beautiful, it was more impressive, right? This is an example of monumental architecture that is designed to convey the power and the influence and the wealth of the institution behind it, which is the Catholic Church. So St. Peter's Basilica took several years to rebuild. Uh, many architects uh, contributed to its design and its construction because, again, these buildings would take a long time. One thing I want to point out right away is the use of classical architecture. So we can see, again, how the Catholic Church is embracing that spirit of the Renaissance and utilizing that classical architecture, like the columns in the front, the domes, and inside we will see arches, all important features of classical architecture. And frequently classical architecture is used to con in buildings that convey a sense of power, like churches or government buildings, right? Because we think of that classical past of, of Greece and Rome. All right. Um, now, in the mid-16th century, Michelangelo would be appointed the new architect of the Basilica. Um, the Basilica had actually begun its reconstruction way back in 1506 and wouldn't be completed until the 1560s. And Michelangelo's greatest contribution is actually the dome, the very famous dome that you see here on top. Um, 
he was able to, uh, to, to sort of adapt ideas from an earlier architect named uh, Bramante, who had a, had a heavy hand in the design and the creation of the Basilica. But Michelangelo, again, sort of like Brunelleschi, uh, was able to not only design the dome, but figure out how to build it as well. And this is really, you know, quite literally the crowning achievement of St. Peter's Basilica. Now here is a glimpse inside the Basilica, and I would just like to argue that this really is the most beautiful and impressive building I have probably ever been fortunate enough to walk into. And I highly, highly encourage you that if you ever have the chance in your life to take the time to visit this, you know, even if, if you are not Catholic or religious in any way, it is still just jaw dropping. Um, I have taken, um, not, not, you know, not only myself, but also I have taken students into this building who just weep with tears. They are so impressed and overwhelmed by how beautiful this building is. Uh, and it's so, it's it just expansive. I mean, it, it is enormous, right? And every single nook and cranny of the basilica is embedded with just this magnificent, famous, you know, just unparalleled art, right? Over to your right from this paint, from this image right here would be Michelangelo's Pieta. Um, straight back, you see some of the work by Bernini and his contributions that would occur later in the 17th century. Um, there's, a, there's tombs of popes around the edges of the basilica that each have their own magnificent uh, sculpt, sculptures uh, to define it because these popes always wanted to communicate their power. Um, and you can see, of course, the use of classical architecture. I showed you the columns and the dome on the outside, but inside, of course, are these arches. And look at how big this building is compared to these little people down here. Uh, to give you a size, an, an idea of the size and scale, this part where the sun is coming in, first of all, looks very holy and heavenly. That's obviously deliberate. But you see these letters uh, written kind of on that gold band there. Those letters are six feet tall. So those letters are about the size of one of these people down here. So, you know, in a lecture, it's really hard for me to communicate the, the magnificence and the and the just impressive nature of this building. Um, I, I could rave about it for hours, honestly, but I won't because you've been a very patient, captive audience. Uh, but like I said, I will just end by saying, if you ever have the chance to visit this, I highly encourage you to do so. It is really, in a lot of ways, one of the uh, buildings that helps you understand the power and the beauty not only of the Renaissance, but really just, you know, the capability of the human species. So that brings us to the end of our lecture today. Please do not forget to do your write-up. Uh, we will revisit some of these um, artistic images in class with a nice discussion to go with it. But otherwise, uh, thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.